Thank you, Vijay. Uh, and uh, thank you all for having me here. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Um, just check that everyone can see my screen. Um, so as Vijay mentioned, I, uh, uh, I want to uh, talk to you about um, this question of algorithms and uh, their role in democracy. Uh, and so if, uh, unless you've been uh, living in a cave for the last five years, you will uh, have heard uh, that we are living through an epidemic of fake news. Uh, and so you can see here, uh, according to Google Trends, uh, this term fake news essentially didn't exist uh, before the 2016 election. Uh, and on rare occasions when people did use it, it was, it was usually ref to refer to the, the Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Uh, where it meant really satirical news. So you can see that after the election, it becomes a real thing. Uh, and uh, here it is being defined, uh, and this is the definition in the academic research literature as deliberately false content masquerading as legitimate news, specifically with an intention to mislead uh, or to inflame. Uh, and so the uh, interest in this topic has been intense. Uh, there have been several thousand uh, academic papers published uh, since the end of 2016 uh, with the phrase fake news just in the title of the paper. Uh, you can see uh, Obama recently uh, weighing in, uh, former President Obama recently weighing in to, uh, to talk about the, uh, the problems of social media and fake news undermining uh, democracy. Um, uh, people have been talking a lot about this recently uh, with uh, a potential change of control at Twitter. Uh, and uh, even the Nobel Prize winner, Paul Romo, weighed in in the New York Times a couple of years ago to say uh, that uh, uh, digital platform companies are creating uh, a haven for misinformation and hate speech that has undermined trust in democratic institutions. So it's sort of taken for granted uh, that uh, this is what is going on. Uh, one of the uh, uh, a sort of variant of this claim that you probably also have heard a lot about uh, is that, uh, you know, uh, the, the reason why uh, social media in particular and online services in general are, are, are causing problems for uh, democracy or undermining democracy is because of their algorithms, uh, that algorithms, uh, the ranking or recommendation algorithms uh, uh, are, are trained to uh, show people uh, content that they already agree with, uh, thereby uh, channeling them into what are known as filter bubbles. Uh, or even worse than that, they are pushing them towards uh, uh, even more extreme and radical content that they, than they might otherwise consume, uh, leading to a widespread radicalization. So we've seen a number of uh, very uh, prominent um, uh, journalists in particular, but also many academics uh, weighing in to make claims of this sort. So this, I would say, is a, a fair statement of the conventional wisdom about what is happening right now at this present moment. Uh, what I want to do in this talk is uh, take uh, something of a broader perspective uh, on this question of why are we witnessing uh, uh, troubles with uh, increasing polarization, uh, diminishing trust in institutions and so on. Uh, and the way I want to think about this is if you, if you, if you take a perspective that the problem uh, exists uh, on social media and is specific to, uh, to misinformation and fake news, uh, and you go and look uh, in those areas, you will find bad things and you will draw the conclusion uh, that social media is a terrible place and is filled with misinformation and hate speech. Uh, but the point that I want to, or the perspective that I want to bring up here is that some of this uh, message uh, may be a function of looking under the streetlight, that if your uh, view of the world is restricted to a particular area, uh, then regardless of where the real problems lie, that is where you're going to see them. And so what I want to try to do here is argue that if we want to understand uh, fake news, uh, we have to think about it in the context of not just the fake stuff, but also uh, all of the regular news, which is a much larger universe of information. Uh, and even that sits within a, a larger universe of information, which consists of all 
types of media content that people are consuming on a daily basis. And in parallel with that, not only must we look at social media, uh, but we have to look at all media online, which again is a much uh, larger universe uh, encompassing uh, many other platforms and sources beyond social media. Uh, and then of course, uh, uh, we, we should look beyond even online content because as I'll show you, uh, a great deal of information that people, uh, that average Americans consume comes from other sources, in particular television. Uh, and so with this sort of data-driven perspective, uh, I want to ask a few questions. Where do people get their news? Uh, how much of the news that they do get is actually fake? How much of it uh, is partisan segregated? In, in, uh, in other words, uh, how many people are really living in filter bubbles or echo chambers or whatever we want to call them? Uh, and how much news do they actually consume at all uh, versus other kinds of content? Uh, and so uh, my colleagues and I have uh, published a number of studies over the last uh, few years uh, on these sorts of questions. Uh, and in particular, we have benefited from some, some uh, extremely uh, uh, valuable and, and high quality data that we get from uh, the Nielsen Corporation, which, uh, which uh, runs and manages uh, some very large nationally representative panels uh, of consumers uh, and uh, everything that they look at both online and on television. Uh, and here you can see a figure from a paper published uh, in Science Advances a couple of years ago, uh, where we show average uh, media consumption in minutes uh, per day per person uh, over a three year time period. Uh, and the blue bars uh, refer to uh, content that is uh, other than news, basically entertainment and weather and sports and other kinds of content that people uh, might consume. Uh, the green bars refer to content that uh, is news related uh, and the red bars uh, refer to content that is demonstrably false or fake uh, in the sense of fake news. Uh, meanwhile, the, uh, the dark colors refer to television uh, the medium colors refer to mobile and the light colors refer to, uh, to desktop. So you can see immediately a few points that, that generalize and are, and are extremely robust. Uh, the first one is that the vast majority of uh, what people, Americans consume on a daily basis uh, is not related to the news at all. About 86% of it is, is other stuff and only about 14% uh, of content uh, is news related. So already uh, you have uh, a problem that uh, most of what people are looking at isn't news. Um, the second point I think is even more salient to uh, the research literature, which is that if you look only at news, if you say, well, I don't, I don't care about the other stuff, I really just care what news people are watching, uh, then really you should be looking at television because uh, by a ratio of about five to one, uh, Americans get their news uh, from TV, not uh, from online. Uh, and in fact, uh, our estimate is that about three quarters of Americans consume less than one minute of news today, uh, one minute of, of news uh, per day uh, through any online source at all. So this includes social media, but even beyond social media, on desktop, mobile, you name it, add it all up, three quarters of Americans consume less than one minute of that sort of content per day. So. Uh, the vast majority of Americans are not like us. They're not like uh, academics and journalists who do spend a lot of time consuming news and who probably don't watch too much television. Uh, they are uh, getting mostly non-news. And when they are watching news, they're watching it on TV. Uh, and finally, the, the fake news, the stuff that is uh, deliberately uh, uh, engineered uh, false information that, that is designed to look like real news uh, is really a, a tiny fraction of what people are consuming on average. Um, about 1% of, of news consumption is fake and less than one tenth of 1% of overall media consumption uh, is fake news. So uh, these numbers uh, are, are somewhat different for different age groups. And we have broken them down in the paper into, into different age categories, but these qualitative findings, the rank order of these findings uh, is, is robust uh, with respect to all age groups. So if we then move to uh, a related question of like uh, setting aside quantity, uh, we might ask, well, you know, even if quantities are small, um, 
uh, maybe the problem is that uh, people are consuming uh, only a very specific uh, type of news uh, and that uh, if they're online, that they're being uh, fed or channeled into filter bubbles where they are uh, getting uh, a, a, a sort of um, a very uh, consistently partisan biased take on the world um, and uh, they're not seeing uh, diverse perspectives. Once again, we can do this comparison using consumption data. Uh, we can look over at the same period of time and ask uh, how many Americans are in echo chambers, either uh, online or on TV, where we define an echo chamber as somebody who is getting uh, a majority, uh, in this case, either between 50% and 75% uh, of their, uh, of their uh, news consumption uh, from a, 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 a homogeneous uh, collection, a partisan homogeneous uh, collection of, of sites or, or, or broadcasters. Uh, and so uh, you see some uh, parallel results here uh, that uh, if you look online, uh, only a, a, a very small percentage, about 3% uh, of Americans uh, get uh, their online news uh, from any kind of um, uh, exclusively from partisan sources, both on the left and the right. And that number has been uh, falling uh, over time, as you can see. So uh, it's not that no one is in the filter bubble or, a, or an echo chamber, um, but the percentage is very small. Uh, if you look uh, at television, once again, uh, the problem, uh, to the extent that it is a problem, uh, is much larger. Uh, so about 17% uh, of, uh, of Americans uh, get their TV news either uh, exclusively from, or, or, or sorry, not exclusively, mostly uh, from Fox News, which is the red bar, uh, or from uh, the combination of CNN and MSNBC, which is the blue bar here. And so to the extent that those uh, TV channels are uh, presenting different views of the world, uh, then there is a much uh, larger percentage of the population uh, that, is, um, that is in those in those echo chambers. And you can argue about whether 17% is a small number or a big number, uh, but it's clearly much bigger than 3%. Uh, the other, uh, other um, uh, results in this paper, which is coming out uh, later this year, uh, are that these TV echo chambers are not only much larger than online echo chambers, but they're also more persistent over time. That uh, if you're in an echo chamber uh, in any uh, month, the probability that you remain in it the subsequent month is several times greater uh, for uh, a, a TV echo chamber than online. Uh, and uh, this TV news consumption is becoming increasingly uh, partisan over time. Uh, Finally, if we look at uh, YouTube, which has been a recent focus of attention, uh, largely because of its uh, enormous scale and also uh, incredible uh, user engagement, uh, the amount of time people spend uh, on YouTube is, uh, I think, uh, well in excess of what they spend on other social media sites. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the number of Americans who get news on YouTube is probably, uh, is almost certainly greater than the number who get their news on Twitter, which has received uh, uh, a lot of attention recently. So YouTube is definitely an area that we, that we care about, that we're interested in. Uh, and the question that we ask in this paper, which came out uh, in PNAS uh, last year, uh, is whether we can attribute, um, uh, whether we can find increases in, in consumption of radical content uh, over time, and whether we can attribute that to recommendations versus uh, versus uh, user preferences. And what we find is that overwhelmingly uh, people on YouTube tend to consume relatively centrist content uh, and mostly, again, not news content, so very consistent with our, with our findings on the general uh, web. Uh, in general, they do not gravitate to, to more extreme content over time, that uh, people in, uh, there are people in uh, relatively, uh, in, in, in communities that consume uh, either uh, far right um, uh, content, uh, but those communities are not growing in size and people are not gravitating towards them. Uh, and the people who are in those communities tend to consume similar content both on YouTube and also off of YouTube uh, in the general web. So the overall uh, 
uh, result here seems to point to uh, consumption patterns that are driven by uh, exogenous user preferences. People come into YouTube wanting to consume a particular type of content. YouTube serves that up to them uh, and they can consume as much of that as they want and they do that offline as well. Uh, so there is little evidence in, 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 from a consumption point of view that, uh, that this phenomenon has been driven uh, explicitly by any of YouTube's algorithms. So summing up, uh, the research literature in the last five years has very uh, heavily uh, focused on uh, fake news uh, and particularly on uh, fake news coming uh, from social media. And you can see on the left-hand side of this figure here, uh, a count uh, of, the, uh, of the number of publications that focus on fake news, online news, and television news. And you can see the red bar uh, is, uh, is uh, far higher than the others. And, and in fact, that this figure is a couple of years out of date now, that, that red bar is probably about twice uh, the height at this point, uh, or maybe three times the height. There's been an enormous amount of, of, of concentrated effort uh, on, uh, on fake news. But uh, how uh, what Americans are actually consuming, which is shown on the right-hand side, is, is essentially the opposite, um, where uh, people are, are mostly consuming TV news and not fake news. So if we want to understand misinformation and its effects, uh, we, sh we should, of course, continue to look at the things that we're already looking at, uh, but we maybe need to, but we need to take a much broader perspective. So not just uh, looking at fake news, but looking at everything uh, and, uh, and we need to consider all modes of production and consumption. And one point that I wanna make uh, that I hope you can take away with you uh, is that uh, it is extremely easy to mislead people without lying to them. So this is another study that my colleagues and I uh, from Microsoft Research published last year, uh, where we, uh, we asked participants to make a prediction about which of two startup companies was more likely to become a billion dollar unicorn uh, one founded by a college dropout or one founded by a college graduate. Uh, and in one condition, we showed people examples of companies that were founded by uh, dropouts. Uh, in another condition, we showed them uh, examples of uh, companies that were founded uh, by college graduates. Uh, in another condition, we showed them no examples at all. We just explained the problem to them and asked them to make a bet. So. Uh, I want to emphasize that the examples we showed them were, in fact, the same five companies. Uh, they're real companies. Both of them had two co-founders. One was a graduate. One was a dropout. So everything we said was true. Uh, we told them exactly what we were doing. Uh, we told them that uh, essentially that the information we were giving them was biased. Uh, and nonetheless, we saw a huge effect on their beliefs. Uh, the people who saw college graduates were uh, about 50 percentage points more likely uh, to uh, bet on a company founded by a college graduate than the dropout uh, than if they saw the dropout condition. Uh, uh, and not only that, but they were extremely confident in their bets and they even spontaneously generated explanations for why uh, uh, they bet the way they did. So the message we got from this study is that you don't need to lie to people uh, to mislead them. You can present them true information in a biased manner. And the point I want to make is that this sort of... Uh, uh, biased information is extremely prevalent uh, in regular uh, news media. So uh, something that journalists do all the time is present uh, statistics uh, in their articles as if they are large numbers. And these are examples of, of statistics that were, uh, that were uh, repeated many times uh, in the early days of, the, uh, of this sort of narrative around fake news that, that made this uh, claim that um, fake news was everywhere, uh, what these statistics ignored was the denominator, that, that uh, all of these numbers look big until you think about the total quantity of any of these things online, which are, uh, are, are you know, many orders of magnitude larger. And um, when you think about the denominator, when you put these numbers in perspective, you realize that they're actually very small. Uh, another way you can bias information is by just talking about some things uh, and not others. And so the New York Times uh, in the lead up to the 2016 election, uh, in the eight days uh, uh, before uh, the election, uh, between when James Comey announced the FBI was uh, reopening their investigation uh, and, uh, and the election itself, the New York Times published as many uh, front page articles about Hillary Clinton's IT uh, travails uh, 
than uh, as they published about any policy issues uh, in, the, uh, in the previous three months. So enormous focus of concentration on one particular issue. Um, uh, that is one way of, of, of setting the conversation. Another way uh, is to cherry pick data. So this, the, the example I showed you of the unicorns is, is an example of cherry picking data. We see this sort of effect all the time uh, in uh, just regular journalism where somebody wants to tell a story, in this case about uh, the rise of sexlessness uh, among young men. Uh, Simon Dedeo at uh, Carnegie Mellon University uh, reanalyzed the same data and found that, that uh, depending on which particular time period you pick, you can tell basically any story you want, but probably the most reasonable story is that nothing has changed over the course of uh, the, the period of time. Uh, uh, finally, you can uh, mislead people uh, by slapping misleading headlines on stories. Uh, in this case, uh, the article uh, got, the, uh, got the result correct. Um, the headline reversed the result. In fact, smart people are less likely to believe fake news. Uh, and one of the authors is tweeting about this on Twitter saying, you know, how did they get this so wrong? So again, I'm not saying that the problems that people are concerned about are not real problems. Fake news uh, is, 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 you know, lying to people is definitely bad. Uh, but there are lots of ways to mislead people without lying. Social media and algorithms uh, definitely have problems and we should be worried about those problems. We also should be worried about the total universe of content to which people are exposed. Uh, and polarization, lack of trust, susceptibility to conspiracy theories are also big problems. But I think if we want to really confront them, we have to take this much broader perspective. Um, and I know that I'm out of time, so I just want to quickly say that this is a, a, a big project that we have in my lab at, uh, at Penn, uh, and we, we call this the uh, Penn Media Accountability Project. Uh, and our goal is really to take a data-driven approach to these sorts of questions uh, broadly construed. So thank you very much. I hope we still have some time for questions. Thank you, Duncan. Um, let me just go to the Q&A box to, and I don't know if you can see it, but we can just go down this list until our time is up. So the first question is about news that is not mostly partisan, but persuasive communications, which comes primarily from social media friends, and those in turn tend to be an echo chamber. And I wonder if your studies actually do account uh, for these kinds of effects. Yes. Yeah, so. Uh... What we, we are able to, um, what we can do, so the social media is a bit tricky to study because, um, for example, Facebook is, is a, something of a walled garden. So you can't, uh, when somebody is on Facebook, you, can, you can't see uh, exactly what they're looking at. What we can see is if they click on something, uh, they exit Facebook and go to a, a site on the, on the open web, uh, and we can see that they came from Facebook. So we do have ways of estimating uh, what people are looking at on Facebook. Um, uh, and so that would include, you know, uh, what you're suggesting here, that, that it's certainly plausible that, uh, that some of the bias uh, that people experience uh, comes from algorithms and some of it comes from their social circles and some of it comes from their own preferences. It's really a combination of the three. Um, uh, but all of that would be included uh, in, the, in the consumption data that we're, uh, that we're observing. So uh, we can't necessarily, um, uh, disentangle these different causes, but we can quantify the, the, the total quantity. And so if you think about online consumption versus TV consumption, where the latter is clearly not algorithmically uh, uh, generated, uh, you can still see that uh, echo chambers are a much bigger problem on TV than, than online. Excellent. So the second um, question, again, I'm going to the Q&A box, and this is a little tricky. As you think about the difference between sort of fake news and biased news, and you've talked about both of these, um, is there, and maybe there's something that Eric will also talk about later, but is there a way we could uh, regulate this and what's the role of the government? And, uh, and of course, if individuals are smarter, they wouldn't run into this issue. And mm -hmm. have you thought about these kinds of uh, more societal, society-wide issues, if you will? Uh, yes. Well, so I think, uh, you know, the, the, the perspective that, that I take on this, pro on, on this question is that, um, you know, we, it's difficult to design solutions to problems when you don't know what the problems are, right? And so I think that the very first step that we have to take is to have a, you know, a better descriptive understanding of reality, 
Like what is actually happening? And so that's sort of a lot of the work that, I, that we're doing right now is, is very descriptive. We don't uh, have a lot to say about the causes of things and we, we don't even have specific recommendations for interventions. Um, but uh, I think it's, you know, it's revelatory just to understand that, uh, you know, uh, or, or to, to consider the possibility that subtly biased information that is consumed um, by millions of people um, from uh, journalistic, you know, professional organizations that they trust might have uh, more of an effect in terms of misleading them than obviously flagrantly false information that is consumed by a relatively small number of people. Um, and so I think, you know, what to do about that is a great question, um, but just uh, understanding that that is a possibility and, and, and you know, and even sort of holding that up as a mirror to the uh, to the mainstream media uh, world uh, can cause us to reflect on uh, you know on possible causes that we might not have considered. So I think that sort of at this stage is is our main objective. But I agree the question of what to do about it uh, is extremely tricky. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, Duncan.